Okay. Hi all and welcome to the next SEOM seminar. Um, this week we have Zach Smith um, who will be telling us about the data port portal developments um, at Alwazi. Zach is a, a web developer at Alwazi um, but also interested in other things. Uh, I've seen him on lots of emails playing with spatial data and, and, and other things like that. Um, and yeah, he was very enthusiastic to tell us about the new data catalog and, and from what I've seen, it's looking quite exciting and uh, something we've been waiting for. Um, so Zach is going to walk us through uh, what he's been up to in the, in the last couple of years with Sam. Um, just a reminder, please, to pop questions in the chat window and I'll ask them at the end. If there's anything you'd like me to, uh, if there's anything you didn't understand and you'd like me to interrupt Zach, then maybe just label it urgent and I'll, and I'll ask him a question in mid-flow. Um, mid um, yeah. Will you take it away, Zach? Uh, okay. Uh, let me get my presentation open and share my screen. And close Slack, which is a bit of a heavy process. Okay, good. Now I need to share screen. And I want to share. Um, sorry, I'm used to Chrome. I actually want to share my entire screen, not just a window. Is that possible? Uh, I think so. Unless maybe, yeah, you can share. If you've got a bunch of different tabs in one thing, you can share that and then move between tabs. Or do you have other programs open? Um, if I so if I share my screen, uh, I guess you can see the the blue. Yeah, I can see the blue. I can see your uh, yeah, Chrome. And Chrome if I swap, swap, can um, can yeah. you see the same data portal? Yeah, I can see the data portal. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. And if I okay, so I am a, a web developer at Wazi, and over the last year or so, I've been working on the Seon data portal. It's so it's, yeah, it's about April last year. So it's really nice to, to share to share this work that I've done and get feedback and um, suggestions and criticism, etc. Um, I'm very responsive to all of that. Um, and so the site in question is yeah, catalog say on ACZA. Every time you refresh the page, you get a different background. So I'm going to look for one that I like more than others. Kind of as I develop, I add backgrounds and then delete the ones that I don't like. Okay. Oh, no, this is not good. All right. Fine. So this, this um, in the abstract, I know that uh, I mentioned that I'd be sh showing the sound data portal and then talking about the backend architecture and a little bit. I've been convinced by a number of people that backend architecture is not a is not a welcome kind of topic uh, for this particular talk. So I do have slides available for that, but that will be more on a question basis rather than part of the, part of the presentation. This presentation is going to focus on just the existing work that is the Seon Data Portal, uh, as well as a short introduction of of, of what of, of the Seon Data Portal, how it works in as a website, which I think is just useful generally. So. Um, all websites, I would like to share a different screen. If I share this screen, can um, is this viewable? We're just seeing uh, the catalog that sounded as it said it. Maybe okay. unshare and then reshare. Stop share. Um, click multiple. Oh, great. Okay. Right, so a good way to, to think about websites is just as a request response model. Um, so you have a server and you have a user. And that user sends a network request to a server. That server will, via a variety of steps, cobble together text. Uh, and as a web developer, the, the, the work that I do involves configuring what exactly these steps are. That's the code that we write. And in response, the server will produce text in the form of HTML, 
HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Browsers will load that, that text and display a website. Now, the catalog as a website is quite, is quite interactive. It's dynamic and interactive. And what that means in practice is that uh, these kind of request response pairs are continuously happening behind the scenes. Uh, so, so long as the website is opening, is open, uh, there's communication between the server and the client. And what that looks like from a, from a looking at the, at the website is that when you load the page, an initial 26 requests are made. Um, I'm hoping you, you can see my, my uh, let's say on data portal now. Yeah. Yeah. And as you move your mouse over the page, additional requests are made, made 28. Every time you search, 29 requests. Every time you change, change the, the roots of the, of the site, additional requests are made. Uh, in other words, it's quite a chatty application. And that kind of uh, is, is a good time to think about, you know, what is a good website? And a good website is, is really a means of, de um, of delivering content over a geographical distance. And depending on who you're delivering to, then you have certain considerations that you need to make. So in the case of the catalog, I, I think, and this is always open for correction, but I think that most users are going to be desktop they are going to have access to a reliable internet connection and perhaps uh, not have a lot of bandwidth into that. And uh, on that note, um, the network stats when you're loading the catalog website are quite good. So on initial, on initial load with cache disabled, you'll load 1.1 megabytes of data and it will take four seconds. And in addition, uh, additional requests to the same sites uh, are very efficient with only 24 kilobytes transfer. Mobile phone, it's important that websites look good on mobile phones just because users will usually at least once open a website on a mobile phone and it's a little embarrassing if it doesn't look good. The, the catalog does, I'm happy to say, uh, but it's not exactly the, the intended use case. So the catalog is a highly dynamic website that is quite efficient in terms of its network usage, but does require network constant network activity, which I think is sensible since you're trying to search servers that are, um, and it would be difficult to make that an offline first um, or find first environment. So say on data portal, in terms of functionality, it has about 15 features and you can group those features into three different modalities. There's this search modality where you can use the site to access data. There is an atlas modality where you can share spatial, the visual representations of spatial data sets. And there is a, a data modality where you can interrogate the data, create charts, create dashboards, uh, and share that. From a feature perspective, running through the search, It is publicly accessible. As you, as you look at the records that are returned, you can view quick previews of them. Um, which is just a visual representation of what, the, of what the data sets are. If they're spatial data, not all data supports that. You can generate citations. Is this little button over there in any of the, the kind of more common formats. There were initially about 300 different formats, but Leo asked me to, to um, remove most of the unused esoteric ones and make it easier for everyone, which on the whole, I agree with. Um, you can look at the metadata describing data sets in a formatted view. And obviously you can download data by clicking on the, by agreeing to the terms of use. In addition, you can share lists. So by searching for, for example, groundwater, I know that that will return 12 published data sets by sound. You can select all of these data sets and you can share either uh, an embedded iframe or a link. And that will open a list of data 
of data sets to, to be shared over the social media, uh, over uh, email or, or wherever. And this is actually used quite extensively at the moment for the server work that Alwaz is doing. Uh, if I can find it, it is, I had a, Uh, so part of the Sava part of the Sava website involves a oh, oh it's behind sorry part of the Sava website includes collections of sustainable development gold related data and each of these different blocks will link to a prepared search um, of relevant data sets and you can sub you can for example, if you were to look at data sets related to the clean water and sanitation goal, then you can get 500 and something records, 539, and you can apply additional search criteria on that. Okay. And you can subset again. So you can continuously subset the list and share. Which is not actually an intentional feature. It was more that an initial way of sharing lists resulted in this kind of recursive sharing mechanism, which I think is quite nice. Okay. So beyond disseminating published data, say unpublished data, and that's published node data, as well as other records, there are the, the additional tools that this software provides um, is an Atlas module and a data module. So looking at the Atlas module, the Atlas module is useful for comparing visual, for a sort of doing a visual comparative of, it, of, of different spatial data sets. And an example of such a use case would be to look at South African heat wave, heat waves. This just happens to be a nice. Well, well suited data sets for this example. When you log into the portal, then additional buttons appear allowing you to download raw records, create atlases and create data books. This is still very much a working progress. Um, but a, a proof of contract, oh, no, this is not the right one. That is um, very specifically a data set that the, the data science team asked me not to show. There we go, that is the one that I should be showing. By selecting more than one spatial data set on, a, on an atlas, it's possible to compare how, how the output of models change based on, based on in some input parameter. Um, so this is, and you can see that the number of places in South Africa that experience really severe heat waves decreases when you kind of um, increase the thresh threshold for what a heat wave constitutes, which is which I think is nice. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. Um, I think it's a. I know that some of the nodes produce spatial data, and I know that we publish a lot of spatial data. So this is just a nice tool for for visually sharing that, and you can share without the bar at the top. Likewise, you can embed, you can share, and um, you get a publicly accessible atlas. So that's um, the Atlas module and then the data module, which is currently also a work in progress is currently what I'm working on. It's, it's one of, it's, it's, I'm quite excited about it. It's, I've really enjoyed doing this work uh, and it's 
um, hopefully useful. I, so the way that works is, um, you can select data sets. Of district parameter. And you can select any number of data sets. I think it's limited to 50 at the moment. And this button here will kind of uh, collect all of these separate, separate, separate um, sets and load them into a single Postgres database which is useful because it allows for joining disparate, disparate data. This can take a bit of time, a few, just maybe a minute, uh, because the data sets have to be downloaded and I know that the health district systems is quite large. So this UI. What is it? Well, on the left panel, there is um, a list of all the data that's available. The number at the top here is the schema number because I know when querying Postgres, sometimes that's important. These dark, these um, dark colored uh, table uh, text is the names of the tables that I've just imported. I don't have a good way of identifying what the tables should be called prior to import. So once you import tables, you can rename them and then these Gray, grayed out text are just generally available data sets um, that, are, that are useful and are made available to every data or context. You have a query window here. This um, currently supports SQL, but it could easily support R or Python or Go or anything else, so long as you can figure out a, a way to um, specify the, the data source as the Postgres database. And you have table results when you run queries and you have this dashboarding tool that allows you to quickly put together charts. And to show how that works, oh, hold on, you probably didn't see that. Uh, we can see Sound Data Portal, a bunch of names on a bar on the left, and then two windows with a red one and a blue one in the top left corners. I can use the annotate button. Okay, so this is the, on that side, you have a um, list of data, the dark, the dark, um, these, these names here are names of the tables imported. These are publicly accessible. Um, this is a query window. This can support SQL. This currently supports SQL, but can support R and Python, et cetera. This is a table that shows results. And this is the location of where you can create charts and dashboards and share them. OK. So now I need to unannotate that. Um, well, that's upsetting. Am I going to have to have? Okay. And to to give an example of, of how this could work, I have prepared some SQL. as a proof of concept. One of the main sort of design driving decisions that I've made, decision making kind of drivers that I have when I'm working on this is 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 what is um, is what is useful to me because coming into say on I, I haven't had prior experience with spatial data and this this developing this is kind of an opportunity to get involved in that and largely this this work reflects how I as someone. With, with reasonably good technical skills can come in and 
and explores their own data sets. Uh, so for example, first, the first thing is how do you kind of load all of as many data sets as you want into Postgres and then download it? Well, like that, right? And okay, now, well, but now I have to set up a Postgres instance by myself to explore this data. Uh, okay, so instead of doing that, you can make this query window available. Um, and then I know that some of the some of the data science work involves sharing and sharing sort of uh, pro, share, sharing um, query data, and that's and that's why there is a dashboarding functionality. So the idea is that it makes this data more accessible, um, and I hope it does. Have to rename some of the tables. And that will result in a timer that will run for about seven minutes or so. Um, that's part of the proof of concept of this of this work is can you can you write SQL of unlimited sort of complexity and just expect it to work? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, but instead of making everyone wait for seven minutes while this runs in the background, the, another query will produce the same data sets statically, same data set statically. And with the data set, you can now start creating charts. So, so it's easy to produce pie, bar, line, table, map, and pictorial charts. And the customer I'll show you in a, in a second. So this can be chart one. Actually, what it, I can say what it is. This is um, um of river kilometers per biome. The reason I used the river data sets was as a GIS, um, as a special data, it was a good introduction for me. Obviously, this can be applied to any other spatial data set. Um, and the description is the polygon segments biome polygons. And that is a chart, which can be shared and embedded. So main, the main work that's left uh, on this kind of functionality is making sure that it's, it's, it looks somewhat nice, nicer than this. Um, okay, so now we can add that chart to a dashboard. And we can use the drag and drop interface to decide what that should be. We can re give the dashboard titles. And create a filter. Actually, without the filter, you can share the share that dashboard. And this is the beginning of the shareable dashboard. It can be useful to filter charts on such a dashboard. So you can use the filter by biome name, for example. You can add that filter. And then reloading that page will include a filter. The, these queries are just um, as, as part of an example of uh, creating a dashboard. It's occurred to me that it might not be interesting uh, watching this. Uh, if so, let me know. But um, for the next five minutes or so, 
it would really it will really just be putting together a dashboard as an example just to show how quickly it can be done um, otherwise i can skip uh, uh. I find it quite exciting, so um, I'm happy for you to carry on. If anyone else uh, has any complaints, put it in the chat window. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I would not be offended. I enjoy I enjoy looking at data, but here it goes. All right. So as a second example, it follows on from the first SQL query where where I was um, inter where I was looking at the intersection of river lines, so polygons with five biome lines. However, I, I had to simplify the polygons for the biome geometry because otherwise the query was going to take a lot longer than seven minutes to run. And so I wanted to check with the simplified polygons that make up the biomes is that you know is it still a reasonable result or have I created seven little circles that you know mean nothing and so this query will look at the point counts of the original polygon versus the simplified polygon so 97 to 4 I mean that's quite a lot obviously with the percentage resolution change of you know, quite a lot um, and it looks at the shapes of the original versus the simplified uh, spatial data and then the use of this is that you can create charts, you can create maps showing what each of these looks like. So I could say that this is the original biome, biome polygons. Um, no resolution. That would be a map with biome. I think that original point count is the one, and then uh, original geo. And that is the original, uh, what's, um, I think, slicer, I think it's called, where you, where you group, the, group the river data. And then you can do the same thing with the, with the simplified. Um, reduction. Sorry. Simplified point count and then a simplified geo. And you can add these to the dashboard. what that looks like. Uh, visually, and only visually, because I know there's probably more to it, I can say that um, I'd say that the reduction in polygon complexity is, is not going to greatly affect the uh, uh, the result of this query, which is which is the point of this somewhat contrived example. I'm aware that this uh, that this pie chart actually just reflects the amount of area of each biome in South Africa, so it's not necessarily a how many how much how, what you know how wet is a particular biome, um, but it does from for me it helped uh, it helps just it's a as a proof of concept I think it's quite good. Then. To demonstrate bar chart functionality, which is quite interactive, here is a list of South African rivers. Thank you. 
and you can zoom in on that from the bar charts and move things around. And again, that can be added to the, to the dashboard. Uh, maybe add a filter so you can do river names. And also include a table of the same data. Add that. I need to look at what that looks like. There is a table of the data and an interactive bar chart showing the rivers. So the final query is a um, is an example that it's not only spatial data that you can use to to uh, as to feed these these dashboards, uh, but any of Seon's published data sets, uh, and soon and soon unpublished data sets as well. Actually, there's no reason that you can't upload something to this column and then use it here. The main reason not to do HDB. Main reason not to do that at the moment is that um, I just haven't got to it. And so that would make a decent line chart. Oh. Data sets. Um, here. Uh, gears, x axis, and the y's can be the numeric indicator. That's some, um, I think it's an index actually. I'd have to check with the data science team to find out what that is. And again, it's a it's a different kind of chart. And so the last the last kind of chart that I would like to demonstrate on this is um, is the custom chart. This is very much a work in progress, but it's definitely the most useful option. Um, creating a custom chart will will allow you to edit JavaScript directly. And I hope it's it's uh, sort of evident what this does. And that looks really intimidating because I know this it's a JavaScript function, but in reality, the library that we are using to do this, to, to create these charts um, can produce many, many examples that are, that differ only by, uh, by a single JavaScript object. And so pretty much any of these examples is immediately reproducible with control C, control V. Sometimes they make additional requests for data, um, which can be done, but it's that's not, it's slightly more complicated. But for example, um, this, this, this one probably works quite well. E-charts, so it's Apache E-charts, it's an Apache um, organized, it's an Apache organized, um, Apache, Apache control library. Apache is one of the bigger open source maintainers in the world. So it's quite authoritative in that sense and it's quite good. Hmm. 
save that. This chart doesn't update, but this one does. Um, uh, and then you can, again, you can add that to the dashboard. And the filters will be applied appropriately. So not so filtering on biome won't affect the tables, the, the, the rivers. Filtering on rivers won't affect won't affect um, non-related charts. And uh, in terms of is this a good dashboard or not, so can you share it? So a couple things you can check are how much data is required when loading it. Preferably with cache disabled. Loading this dashboard requires 55 network requests and two megabytes of data, um, which I still think is reasonable. And it is mobile friendly, so you can share it on mobile and expect that it will look good, which is known as responsive web design. Uh, and most websites are at the moment responsive. So those are the three, that's the three sort of, that's, those are the three um, um, functions or, or that's the, the, mo the modules that the say on data portal support are the search, which is publicly accessible, which is quite stable and allows for, for finding and downloading sales data sets. And the Atlas, which is a working progress for sharing a visual representation of data and the data module, which is a working progress for creating dashboards and interrogating data. Uh, and then together that sums up pretty much the entire functionality of the Seon data portal. Um, the only other thing that I'd like to mention quickly is that, it's, um, is that we do, do take logs Logs are important, otherwise you can't tell who are, who's using it. And we log mouse moves. We have one point, probably 1.5 million now of those since I wrote the slides. We have 4,500 plus clicks on the sites. Um, we, and we have probably around 360 downloads plus at the moment. We also log, which is not included on this site, uh, the queries that are run every time a query is run. And with this data, we can, we can very easily create really complex uh, user experience interactions. So you can look at users landing on pages. To, you can see where they're referred from. You can look at do users referred from X versus Y behave differently. Um, can users find the filters? Can users find the, the filters by the way are, um, Filters, by the way, are here. On the left, these are configurable. You can extend, you can search by, by polygons. You can search by keywords, publication, or any, any facet, really. It's also possible to include this, to, to extend this to be site level. Um, this, the data that the, the, the that this, site makes available comes is comes is published data from Seon and that comes through the open data platform which is handled by Mark Jacobson. Um, uh, so yeah you publish and it will come come onto the site. This is I, I guess the way I would think of it is that the open on the one you have the writing side of the system where you publish the data and you have the reading side of the system and this and this work is on the read side of the system. Uh, okay. So you can look at how users interact with the page and you can and you can aggregate downloads according to IP address, IP location, et cetera. And I would show you that, but I'm not on the VPN, so I can't actually access that interface. And that about sums up my presentation. There are some GIFs available on the on the um, 
PowerPoint just in just in case anyone would like them. Very cool, Zach. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's exciting to see how far how far things have come um, and the and the and the work that's in progress. It's very exciting as well. Um, we have about 10 minutes to do questions. We, we need to be off at, at 5 to 11 because Sue has a meeting following this. Um, but we do, well, I have a couple of questions and then Julia has put a question in the chat window. She's asked, um, if I understand things right, it's running the queries and chart creating code every time someone loads the dashboard page. If you have something that will take long to run, but you want to show it on a dashboard, is there a way to handle that? I suppose it's just how you code it or... The queries, uh, initially I included the, the long running query as an exalt, uh, sorry, as an example of, of how you can produce data from a long running SQL query, yeah. add that to a dashboard and that's instantly available. So the way that the way it's working at the moment is that the output of the SQL query is copied to back to a database and that's made available by a dashboard. So it should be, um, so for that particular query, the seven minute query that's, that I was working with, uh, produced seven rows. So that means that the charts that you create from that query yeah. output should should have a negligible, okay, negligible weight. Yeah. So you do all the kind of pre-processing, and then when people interact, it's just quick and easy. Yeah, very exciting to see that functionality. Um, you mentioned being able to use other um, coding languages uh, like R or Python. Um, is that in the pipeline, um, you know, so, so I think most of the kind of scientists, at least in say on work either in R or Python, some work in JavaScript, um, but not many are, are working in SQL at this stage, I don't think. The choice for SQL was because um, that was sort of, when I'm going on to this project, there's a lot of unknowns. And so SQL yeah. is, is, is a That's way to mitigate neat. that from my perspective. Uh, in terms of making the same thing available by R, I, I don't have to understand the R language or the Python language or how these engines work. Usually there's tools that, you, that allow you to kind of pass these, pass the text that makes up R code into a, you know, an execution context and you get the result back. So yeah. as, as a web developer, mostly I'm just connecting, connecting things that already exist. So it's not too difficult to make R or Python available, um, probably you know, a few days yeah. once, once I start that. So, so, and uh, and then the other thing is, so you you were working with the PostGIS database in that example. Is it always in PostGIS, or or can it be non-spatial data? Yes, it can be non-spatial data. So Postgres is the base yeah, database, and you add an extension for the GIS. Yeah. And at which point, I would just call the whole thing PostGIS. But you don't lose functionality for for, for the Postgres side of things. Okay. Uh, you just have an additional number of functions available. Okay. Yeah, that's very nice. I mean, I know R has a bunch of packages that can link directly into PostGIS databases. So, um, and and actually, the code does look very similar to the SQL code these days. So, so that's quite exciting. I think I think Python is the same. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm excited to fiddle with that. Uh, my one of my other questions was um, about. Uh, the and, and I see Tim is on the call too, and he's going to groan uh, about links to the OBS database and whether we're going to be able to pull data from that into these kinds of dashboards. The answer is, I believe the the intention is. So I'm not. Uh, I, 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 this is kind of. I'm not very familiar with what's yeah. happening on the right side of the system, where where you have to worry about you know space on hard drives and that kind of stuff and actual yeah. physical things. Uh, my understanding is that the output of the OBS of the OBS database will be published um, right. in some aspect, in which case it will become available for for this. So it's any published database data at the moment is available, and there will be the ability to upload kind of supplementary data. I think that could be useful. Okay, so so is anything that's going to publish with the DOI would, would be available for playing with the dashboard? Yes. Um, or sometimes not even with the DOI, anything that comes through the open data platform, okay. which is the curation publishing workflow. Okay. Cool. That's very exciting. <laughs> if it's not um, sentient. And then, and then are the queries that you're running, are they running on, on Sound's physical servers or are they running on the cloud? 
they're running on say on servers the reason is that so if if um if a table in postgres has maybe you know 200 megabytes it would be difficult uh, or impossible really to to bring that through to a client and run a query there okay so the queries are run on sounds physical servers uh which i um funny it's actually it's, i was thinking about this the other day because my work of, as a web developer over the last five or six years has really not included ever turning on a computer i've only ever used virtual servers uh okay. and it's like it, it makes it really easy it's hard it's easy to forget at the sort of at the other end that there are in fact physical servers that are maintained and run with networks and everything and yeah. to this extent uh sean sean swanapool has really uh it's he's, he's really helped so much that i, I can't even tell that I'm, I'm working on his his computers yeah I think that's like the ideal scenario. <laughs> Here's this resource available. Who knows where it comes from? <laughs> it pretty much is like that, yes. <laughs> um, uh, Nikki said, uh, will visualization tools for non-coding people be available? So kind of, I suppose, point and click version of what you were doing. There are code generators. So I know things like Oracle and DB2, they do actually have SQL generators that you can use with a click, um, with a kind of a point and click. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they're very good. Uh, so the the difficulty there is figuring out how do you take a data set and generate a table, or how do you sort of change data from a table to to be usable in a dashboard without either SQL or Python. Yeah, um, it, it's very limiting. I think um, we could do something. But it would be limiting. Yeah, I suppose you could make it simple for for things that are repeated. So, say you say you have a dashboard for every automatic weather station, for example. Um, you could just change like the inputs are like the first three lines of code or something, and then you can you know you can copy and paste the code and you change the, the, the first three lines, the names in the first three lines, and hit run, and 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 then you don't actually have to understand the rest of the code. Um, but yeah, I would also imagine it'd be quite difficult to do it without being able to code at all or without having to engage with the code at all. Um, yeah. yeah, there are, and Microsoft releases uh, software called SSIS and SSRS and all sorts of acronyms um, that do kind of provide visualized coding environments. Um, but from experience, you know, even then, you still have to understand uh, types. So, you know, although you can create flow charts that represent your, your systems, uh, at the end of the day, you still have to understand the difference between doubles and integers, and it just becomes more complicated. So we, yeah. for, we can produce dashboards, for example, that are of repeated uh, of data sets that are of the same structure via point and click. Um, mm -hmm. We would have to add on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. look at that data set, create the code, and then deploy it to allow for point and click. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's where you know if you can make it accessible to R and Python and JavaScript users, then it would definitely you know that would get us a long way and and put less burden on the on the kind of you know, on on your team in terms of hey, please make me a dashboard that does <laughs> you know, and and I'm sure the students would love to play. <laughs> it's the students with are the ones with the coding skills for the most part. Um, Cool. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? So from here, uh, next next month um, on my list, and he's probably forgotten. Our next speaker is uh, Tommy Bornman from Owanle, and the title I have is Antarctic Stuff. Um, so I'll have to press him for an answer or a substitute. Um, the model from here is we're going to be changing the way the seminars work in that we're hoping to roll towards having a rolling host rather than it being me. I'm actually leaving Seon at the end of the month, so um, so I'm not going to be uh, able to run these every month. Um, but I think we're going to start rotating between the nodes is the ideal. Uh, we'll be starting with um, Glenn running the next one because I'm going to give him instructions and hand over as an experiment. Um, and then I think Caitlin Ransom, who's working with um, the uh, um, with Kogi, uh, is going to assist with things like um, recording and and uploading and that kind of thing. 
Um, so expect to see a different face next month. Um, but I might be in the wings to help should, uh, should Glenn need any assistance, but I, I think it's unlikely. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, yeah, great talk, really interesting, and really exciting to see um, these systems coming along. It's something that, you know, in my almost 10 years at Seon, we've been like, well, what's going on with the data systems, guys? So it's, uh, and it's a, I know it's a steep trajectory to get things working, and then all of a sudden you hit the exciting space where, where, where from the outside you can see them see them starting to work kind of like your uh, your example with uh, accessing the, the physical servers we mostly don't see the all the work that goes into getting that up and running and that's the that's the hard slog for a long time but once things are accessible and all of a sudden it's exciting and uh, and and the, the value is shown so so thank you very much for giving us a quick overview of, of what's going on and we're excited to watch the space all right thank you thanks very much um, have a Thanks good so. weekend, everyone. Yeah, you too. Thanks all. So.